very much for coming along here tonight. Because at one level this is a campaign about leadership of the party, but it's also about a lot of things to do with how we do our politics, change society, and how we bring people together. Those that have already spoken have shown their passion, their determination for all the causes that they fight for and the way that they stand together. And I'm particularly proud that we had speakers from the All Grief Justice campaign here today. Because what happened at All Grief was as appalling as so many other injustices that have happened within our society over the past years. They have to be opened up, there has to be an inquiry, and indeed the first question I put to Theresa May on becoming Prime Minister was, when will there be an inquiry into Augury? A public inquiry that we may know the truth of what happened there. But we also trust those people that have been activists for many years, those that have stood on cold and wet street corners with petitions, looking for justice for so many causes. Those are the people that have built the public consciousness, that have built our movement, not the columns of the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, the Telegraph or the Sun. Ordinary people talking to other people about how we could do things differently and better within our society. And I've been asked by the Trades Council to read out a message for a very special person who suddenly who's passed away and we're very sad. That is the loss of Shirley Frost. I want to read this out. This is on behalf of Sheffield Trade Union Council, wishes to record his profound sadness at the sudden death of Shirley Frost. Tireless working class campaigner for progressive causes and well known to the Sheffield Trade Union and Labour movement. She was best known for her prominent role in Sheffield Defend Council Housing, where she played a major role in the campaign to stop the Tories' despicable housing and planning bill. She was a leading figure in the bedroom tax campaign and fought tirelessly for a decent and proper welfare state to support working class people in hard times. She put her mouth where her heart was and spoke up for the poor and disadvantaged. She was a great example to all of us. She will be sadly missed by all of us. Thank you, Shirley, for all you did in your life. And thank you, Sheffield TUC, for giving me that opportunity to say that about her. This is a campaign, as I said, about leadership of the party, but it's also about how we do our politics. People achieve things because they stand up. When I was here for Harry Harpham's funeral, he went all through the miners' strike in Nottingham. One of the few who stayed in the NUM, one of those who was on strike, one of those who was in solidarity with miners all over the country. And he had a very hard time. And I said to Harry, how did you feel at the end of it? And what, what do you think about it? He said, I felt proud and I would do it all again if I had to. So it's people like Shirley and people like Harry who've done so much for our movement. We were all devastated and angry when only, what, uh, 15 months ago we lost a general election. A Tory government comes in with a small majority. A Tory government that comes in and immediately sets about not just austerity but austerity heavy on the poorest and most vulnerable people within our society. And in that general election campaign in May of last year, I thought our biggest problem was that there wasn't a clear enough alternative being put by us to the people of this country. It's all very well offering good policies, and there were good policies on housing, on health, on how we minister education, many other things. There were indeed good policies. But the problem was, we were also accepting the argument 
that the banking crisis of 2008-9 somehow or other had to be paid for by cutting the services that are necessary for the majority of people in this country whilst accepting that the very poorest minority would continue to be very wealthy and indeed become even wealthier as a result of the tax system that we've got. And somewhere along the line, we had also fallen into this trap that uh, welfare, as it's increasingly termed, is somehow or other can be used as a term of abuse. I don't actually like using the word welfare. I would much rather use the words social security for a system in which we provide for the security of all, all in times of hardship as well as as well as more prosperous times. I think we have to adopt the language that's appropriate to the justice that we're seeking. But you know what happened? As a party in Parliament, we were asked to abstain on the Tory welfare reform bill and the 12 billion cuts it was about to make. Well, none of us were sent to Parliament to make the living conditions of the poorest constituents we represent even worse off, the, surely the whole purpose of the Labour Party has to be about redistribution of wealth and of power in our society and within our movement and our party. And so I was very pleased when after the election, when we won that election because of the movement of people who wanted politics done differently in society. I asked John McDonnell to take on the job of Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I'm delighted he did, and he's done an absolutely brilliant job as Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. Because what John has done is confronted, confronted the whole concept that austerity is somehow or other something that's necessary. I tell you this, and John has said it so many times, it's now it's going to be in the Oxford English Dictionary within, within a few months, I'm sure. Austerity is a political choice, not an economic necessity. It's a political choice that's been made by those who wish to continue the economic narrative we've all been fed for the past 30 or 40 years that somehow or other a high level of public ownership, a high level of public participation in the economy is somehow or other a bad and a dangerous thing. This concept that it's bad and dangerous grew particularly in the politics of the right in the 1970s. The right in the USA, the right in Latin America, the right in the world's financial institutions, who then preached to countries all over the world, you've got to reduce the size of your public service in order to privatize public services and bring international capital in to run them. And Reagan did it in the United States. Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister in 1979. And what then happened? An attack on public sector housing, on council housing through the 1980 Land and Planning Act. An attack on the steel industry by privatization. An attack on the coal industry and the miners' union in 1984-85 on the strike. A lack of investment in, in, in manufacturing industry and heavy industries in Britain, a reconfiguration of an economy in the model of a service economy, not a manufacturing economy, and a brutal attack on local government in every part of the country, nowhere more so than Sheffield and South Yorkshire and the way they were treated by the Tories at that time. And memorably, she fought that election campaign in 79 and in 1983, essentially by offering to sell off the public services and publicly owned industries. It was a bit like selling £10 notes for a fiver. But haven't we all paid the price for that? Yes. You see that? In every devastated former mining village, you see that in all those industries that have gone. You see that in the lower levels of living and wages in every former industrial centre in Britain. Why is it that in Sheffield now, if the uh, minimum wage went 
went up to nine pounds an hour, and it ought to be ten pounds an hour in my view. One third, one third of all the workers in this city would get a pay rise as a result of it. That is what happens when you transit from an organised manufacturing based economy into an unorganised service based economy. So it is about rights at work, it is about rights of representation, it is about the attitude and role we take to the economy of the whole country. And so, when John approaches the issue of how our economy is going to be run in the future, we say this, it is the function of government to reach out to everybody in our society. It is the function of government to set up a national investment bank. 500 billion pounds being made available for investment all over the country in crucial infrastructure, but also housing and also being prepared to invest in manufacturing industry so those high-tech developments, those high-tech discoveries, those good quality, sustainable jobs are supported by a public investment which will improve the living standards and indeed the tax income for government of everybody in the future rather than the few. It's about public investment and public realm. So that investment would be a huge advantage to this city and to South Yorkshire. It would mean a huge advantage to the whole country. But it's also about what we're, about, what we're trying to do as a society. Think back. They proposed the sale of council housing with big discounts and all that. 30 years later, look at the effects of that. Look at the effects of huge housing sufficiency of council housing and look at the number of people that end up sleeping rough and sleeping on the street of this country. Is it morally right or justifiable in any way that people should be forced to beg on the streets of this country or sleep on the streets? No, no. We know it's not and we know something has to be done about it. So, I want us to fight an election campaign on the issues of justice within our society. So, housing is absolutely central to our very being. Imagine what it's like as a child growing up in a private rented sector flat, which you might lose after six months. You might be moved in any city in this country. You might have to change schools. You might lose your mates and lose your friends and go somewhere else and start over. What does it do to that child? Is that child likely to do well in school or not? I think we all know the answer to that. Is that family going to have a clean, dry, warm home? Or are they going to have a place that's drafty, leaky and very expensive to try and keep warm? And we, the rest of us, through a housing benefit system that ends up subsidising poor quality housing, end up paying for that. Wouldn't it be so much more sensible if we invested in the bricks and mortar of sustainable, efficient homes to build half a million council houses during the first five years of a Labour government? And that provides that security. And also, provide the opportunities for those that want to, to move into and buy places with local authority funded or backed mortgages so we end up with a diversity of housing but above all we end up with the determination that everybody in our society should be properly housed in a decent, clean and secure place. In many other countries in Europe, this would be seen as absolutely normal and mainstream. But for the Tories, this is far too much. When they introduced their most recent housing bill, which requires councils to sell off their most valuable properties, which brings in pay to stay, which brings in higher rents, and all those, all those issues, we proposed an amendment, I would have thought, even to the average Tory MP, and I don't know too many average Tory MPs, but there are some there. Uh, the amendment we said was quite simply, every home that's put out for rent on the private rented sector should be fit for human habitation. 
It's not very extreme, is it? It's hardly sort of extreme Marxist left stuff. It just says, if you rent a house, it should be fit for human habitation. Do you know what? They voted it down. They voted it down. They're not even prepared to accept that degree of regulation. Well, I tell you what, a Labour government with our party's policies will do that and will change that. It's also about security in work and opportunities and jobs for people. If you look at the disputes that are going on at the present time and the political fallout from them, Dennis Skinner intervened on a speech John McDonnell was making in Parliament. What a brilliant pair. Um, Dennis said, will he give way? Okay, yes. Of course. Thanks, Dennis. Um, Dennis just pointed out that when he worked at Shirebrook Colliery, people were paid properly. People were in the union. There were working conditions where people supported him, worked with each other, and it was a collective idea, and there was a strong community around it. The Tories came, they tried to destroy the industry, they tried to destroy the union, and they tried to destroy the spirit that goes with it. What is it now? A sport direct warehouse full of workers on zero hours contract in dangerous and unsafe conditions with an agency culture in which one company after another tries to evade its responsibilities for the unsafe and dangerous working conditions that pertain there. Even an all-party committee of the House of Commons absolutely condemned Mike Ashley and Sport Direct and they're now forced to pay a million pounds back in unpaid wages to those staff. So I want to congratulate Unite the Union the union on taking that cause up and, and, de and dealing with it. But there's lessons to be learned there, just as much as there's lessons to be learned by the action taken by Deliveroo workers, again on zero hours contracts in a very difficult and dangerous condition. When people come together, things can and they do change. And that is why I want people to come together in our party. So we change employment law in Britain. So we make it a mandatory responsibility of medium-sized and large companies to recognise trade unions, to recognise the right of people to join a trade union. That we end the zero-hours contract culture. That we do bring in real equality and close the gender pay gap at the workplace. And that we do ensure that um, young workers are not exploited as they are by the lower level of the minimum wage and the appallingly low level of the apprentice, the apprentice levels of payment. So that that degree of exploitation ends. And that would encourage other companies to go even further. But if we allow this systematic undercutting, which is what is at the heart of uh, Tory philosophy and thinking, things are not going to get any better or change at all. They, such as maternity and paternity leave that were agreed by unions all across Europe. We want and will defend those advances, those gains and those conditions to protect those holiday arrangements and maternity and paternity and anti-discrimination legislation. But it's also the issue of how we deal with levels of inequality within our society. Levels of inequality where you take a bus ride across this city and take indeed a bus ride across any major city in Britain. The life expectancy is high in the leafy suburb. It's high around the houses with two cars in the driveway and a nice garden back in front. Then as you go through, you go through Areas get poorer, life expectancy falls, and so on, across every major city in this country. We have to deal with these levels of inequality. That means investment, yes, in better housing, employment, and all those things. It also means investment in a health service that isn't forced to privatise half of its services under the Health and Social Care Act. In a health service that isn't paying through the nose for the ridiculous 
private finance initiative funding that was forced on so many hospitals in the past, which many of us opposed in Parliament, because what it does is makes the NHS a tenant in its own hospital, paying an unpredictable rent, in some cases, to a company in an offshore tax haven. I want an NHS free at the point of use, as a human right, publicly owned, publicly employed, and publicly accountable for what it does. Because if we allow this Tory market philosophy in the NHS to go on and on, what will happen is, those that can afford it will say, well, I've heard about the queues, I've heard about the levels of stress amongst the NHS workers, I'll use my money to buy my way past the queue and go into private health care. That, I'm sure, is in the minds of many of those people. If we allow our health service to be underfunded, in, that will then in turn encourage the growth of the private health market. That in turn will reduce the NHS. So we'll then they end up ultimately not with a national health service as the first and equal port of call for all of us, but the health service of last resort for those that can't afford to be treated everywhere else. Do you think I'm talking pie in the sky? Look at what's happened in the United States where states did have a national health service or a local health service of some sort has now been destroyed by the activities of the right and the pressure of the private medical industry. Keep our NHS, keep our NHS as a human right. And also recognise there is another less public health crisis within this country, and that is the mental health crisis that's facing so many within our society. There is a requirement of parity of esteem within the NHS between physical and mental health. Good, that's right. The problem is there's a terrible level of underfunding of mental health services. There's far too long a waiting time to get to see anyone for talking therapy or any kind of other help. There's often a shortage of emergency beds for those going through a crisis in their lives. That has to be redressed, there has to be proper funding and investment, but there also has to be a recognition by the rest of us that a quarter of us during our lives are going to face a crisis, are going to go through deep levels of stress, are going to need help and support from others. We can and we must and I believe we will change the language, change the mood we do it and recognise that if somebody, any of us, goes through a crisis, don't make jokes about it, don't contact them, reach out and support them. Too many young people, particularly, end up in a very dangerous, lonely, and isolated place as a result of that. I've talked about housing, I've talked about health, I've talked about jobs and how we expand our economy and how we invest in, in people and their skills. But it's also about how we live within a natural world that is rapidly changing. Throughout, through the legislation that we've gone through the European Union, we do have strict issues of environmental regulation and control, strict levels of pollution in water and so on. This government doesn't take any of that very seriously and wants to introduce what they keep on talking about is a bonfire of regulations. I say this, the world is a finite resource. The natural world is there for us to work with, not to destroy. It's an attitude of mind that we have to put to it. And if we, if we pump up into the sky, this beautiful sky up above us today, polluted foul air, it goes somewhere, it blows somewhere else, it lands in another country. If people on the beaches of the Netherlands or France or Germany or Denmark throw their waste and their rubbish into the sea, do you know what? The unsustainable way that we know have been made in a polluted way that we know have destroyed the natural environment in the place that they've made what have we done but export pollution to somewhere else and so i want to do a number of things one is to keep as uk law all those environmental regulations that were imposed through membership of the european union it's good for all of us and it's the only way we can do things together. But I also want to do much more. 
with trade treaties, be they signed at the moment through the European Union or any trade treaties we sign in the future. Yes, you want reasonable and fair trade. That's important, that's necessary. But you also want to ensure you're not at the other end of the scale condoning abuses of human rights or supporting environmental destruction by the goods that we buy or the goods that we outsource for production. There is a level of responsibility for all of us to deal with the issue of human rights abuses around the world and of environmental destruction all around the world. It's a human responsibility we must all have, which is why Whatever the outcome of the negotiations over the European Union, I am not prepared to support the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership because what it would do is import the worst working conditions on both from, mainly from the United States. So we would have the bargain basement of economics on, on one side of the Atlantic being imposed on another and it would give through investor protection the power of global corporations to take national democratically elected governments to court. You think that sounds extreme? Look at what's happened in Australia, look at what's happened in so many other governments around the world where big business is asserting itself over them. Isn't it time democracy asserting itself in the other way? So it's these attitudes that are so important. Attitudes, justice, attitudes, human rights, and attitudes of democracy. I've been a member of the Labour Party all my life. I've um, had at times when I've had one or two minor disagreements with uh, um, some of the things our party has done. But nowhere did I have a bigger disagreement than in 2003 when we were taken to that disastrous war in Iraq. We stood in opposition to that war because we thought the consequences would be dangerous for the entire world, that it would lead to other wars and other conflicts, and that it wasn't because we supported Saddam Hussein and what he was up to. Some of us were very lonely figures in Parliament in the 1980s, opposed to arms sales to Iraq under Saddam Hussein because we weren't prepared to tolerate the human rights abuses that were happening. But many of those that wanted to go to war ignored all that and said, well, actually, the most important thing is to go to war in Iraq and it'll all be over very, very quickly. Look at what has happened as a result. One war begets another war, begets another war, and we end up with the crises we have all across the region. There has to be a political engagement there has to be a political solution to issues. There has to be respect for human rights and international law all over the world. Can't we say, as the primary issue of our foreign policy, would be support for human rights, democracy and justice and law all around the world, rather than the horrors of what we've done in the Iraq war. And those that say, well, that's all very well. I just say this. There is a humanitarian crisis around the world, the like of which we've never seen before. There are now more displaced people around the whole world than there have ever been at any point in recorded history. Those that are dying in the Mediterranean and the Aegean Sea, those that are dying on other coasts, trying to reach a place of safety, are doing it out of desperation. We have to do two things ensure there is a ceasefire in Syria, ensure there is a, a, there is a political settlement and solution in Syria that respects the diversity of that country. But we also have to have a humanitarian response. You cannot blame, as Nigel Farage and others do, refugees for a war that has forced them into, into exile, into seeking asylum somewhere else. We have to get that support and reach out to, to others. And that is what I would want a government to do. And so, these issues are at one level very complex, but they're also about the politics of our society and the politics of our world. The Labour Party was founded more than a hundred years ago because the trade union movement, because 
the working class communities wanted their own independent representation in Parliament. They wanted a party that spoke up and stood up for them. That party was founded with great sacrifice. The achievements, particularly the National Health Service, social security legislation, human rights and equality legislation have been incredible and marvellous. But if we don't change the way in which we approach the fundamental economic questions and attitudes towards our society, then we as a party are diminished and damaged. We live now in a Britain with a postcode lottery on healthcare, a postcode lottery on education, a postcode lottery on whether you're likely to get to university or not, and a postcode lottery of how you're gonna live your life and how long you will live your life. None of that is right and none of that is necessary. Why can't we instead invest in our young people to provide good quality preschool facilities for all children to grow up, socialise and understand each other together. Can't we end the idea that preschool and post-18 post education is somehow a, commod a, a commodity, not a right? And refurbish, rejuvenate, re-strengthen the principle of local education authorities to bring together a family of schools, not the destruction of the education system by academies and free schools and competition between them all. So bringing those together is something that is very important and valuing all people that work in our education system. You can't run a school without a head teacher any more you can run a school without a cook or a cleaner or an admin staff or a teacher or a teaching assistant. It is a teamwork that there has to be. And then you look to what happens when young people reach the age of 18 and uh, want to do other things in their lives. I want them to have a choice. A choice of whether they go to a good quality apprenticeship with a good qualification at the end of it, or they go on to university and achieve something there. But I tell you what, there's two things holding us back. One is poverty, the other is the cost. If somebody is brought up in a poor environment and unable to achieve their potential in school, we are all the poorer for it. We're all the poorer because we don't get the engineer, the nurse, the doctor that could have come from that person. And if we introduce these grotesque levels of fees in universities by lifting the cap, all we're doing is burdening future generations of graduates with debts of 50,000, 60,000, whatever it's going to be. This year, for the first time for many years, the number of working class students going into university is going down, and I suspect will continue to go down. We can, must reverse that trend and change it by reducing the cost of university education and ending the appalling debts that go with it to people. And recognise that education is also about education for life as a whole. So, many of us have parents or relatives that manage to achieve a great deal by going to adult education, going to night school, going to supplementary education. All the funding for that has been destroyed or cut. Can't we recognise that when we as a community invest in education, we all benefit from it? Let's invest in everybody's education. And recognise that the cultural life of all of us is something that's very important. You have the crucibles here to hear. We have that incredible tradition of writing, of poetry, of music, of dance. Make sure that is there. Make sure that is there for all of our children. So that all of our children can learn music in school. All of our children can have that opportunity for their own cultural expression. That is surely what is so strong in our society. And so this campaign is at one level about the leadership of our party, but it's also about how we do politics within our party. I'm proud of the size of our party, proud of the developments we've achieved. 
I'm also welcome back all those people that have come back to listen to what we have to say about the alternative we can offer to the people of this country. So that come the general election, there's a pretty clear choice. Do you want a Tory Britain with the inequality, the poverty and the injustice that goes with it? Or do you want a Britain where we have those values, those values of community, those values of the value of everybody else and the contribution that you can make? And you know what? When communities do things together, when communities do things together to protect their school, protect their hospital, open a park, open a theatre, make sure that jobs are protected and defended in a particular factory or enterprise, do things together, you feel very, very strong at the end of it. But if instead you decide to blame him for the lack of school places, blame her for the shortage in the hospital, blame somebody else for the um, litter in the street or the lack of public transport or anything else. When you get into a blame culture, it's divisive, it's nasty, it creates a very divided and nasty society. And you know what? When you start blaming minorities for the lack of services for the rest of us, it doesn't provide any services and it takes the pressure of those that are underfunding our services in the first place. So come together as communities. Come together as communities. Only half of the young people who were registered to vote in the last general election bothered to take part in the election because too many of them couldn't see the point of it. Can we not, as a party, as a movement, be strong enough to excite and motivate all of those young people to the prospects, the idea of doing things differently? As young people in America, as young people all across Europe are demanding the same thing. End the process of the rolling back of public services. Start instead the process of community investment for the good of all of us. And so, I want us to be strong as a movement, as a party, strong in what our principles and what we're trying to do, and at the end of it, quite simply say this to everybody in every part of this country. Our campaign will change politics. It is changing politics already. Our campaign will improve social justice and equality within this country. Our campaign will change the way we look at the world and our status in this world. And our campaign will ensure that no one, no community and no area of this country is ever forgotten, ignored or left behind ever again. Thank you very much.